Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Want to be more effective at work? Well, try a little flexing, according to our guest, Sue Ashford. Sue, thanks for being with us today. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, Sue, your book is called The Power of Flexing. And I have to admit, that was a new term. I said, I want to know what this is, because when I think of flexing, I think of the teenager on the beach who's showing his muscles and, you know, doing the strongman pose. So what is flexing in the business world? The idea of flexing in this book is that if you're going to grow and develop, which we all need to do over a lifetime in business and in life generally, you're going to need to try different things. And this approach to growth is really one that kind of empowers people to take on their own growth in the ways most important to them and flex, try some new things out, see if if uh, it yields different results. It starts with the idea that you're not going to get the same resu- different result by doing the same thing over and over and over again. And we say that a lot. If you, want, if you do the uh, same over and over, you're going to get the same results. So it's time to change something. And just to support this, I, and I took this from your book, some, uh, I think it's 92% of managers rate these skills as critical to the retention of good employees and better leadership. Is that correct? Well, yeah, people are recognizing that we need to have firms that are attractive to especially young people. If you want to grow people over a lifetime, they want to see the possibility of trying new things, being different, trying out some and raising to some level in the organization. And if they can't see that, they tend to want to go somewhere else. And as I said to you before the show, It was great timing because about two days ago, I'm listening to a news report on the radio and they said, why are people leaving their jobs? Because of their managers, if they're not responsive enough, if they don't connect with them, they just take off and leave. And that's a big expense. Also, it's downtime. The manager or HR has to interview people. So it's a cost to the business. And of course, it's a new team that gets put in and that new person may also leave. Now, to give us an example of what the power of flexing is about, you have a quick anecdote at the beginning of the book of someone named Maggie Bayless. Could you tell us a little bit about her adventure? Yeah, so Maggie was one of the co-founders of one big division in her company, uh, but she didn't really like to lead others. In fact, she was a co-founder and her co-founder did all the leading and managing and she did more of the back uh, development, that kind of thing. It was going along swimmingly until he said he was going to retire. And then suddenly, you know, all of that kind of came on her docket as something she needed to do. And to do that, she really needed to flex. She knew she needed to grow. She needed to grow in her interpersonal skills with, you know, people who reported to her in order to get the most out of them. And she needed to learn a whole bunch of different things, patience, uh, you know, clarity, uh, and so forth. So she really took it on and tried out some new experiments in her managerial life, including things like mindfulness, uh, meditation, so that she could be more present with people in her workplace, sort of dealing with their issues and problems and so forth. Uh, So it was a real turning point for her and led her to the idea that she needed to grow. And as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking, do we just have to be more conscious of this? Because a manager and leaders They're quite busy during the day. They're going from one thing to another. And then, of course, there's interruptions and things, the unexpected problems that we never think are going to come up, but they do at the last minute. Do they, I guess the best term would be, is this more in the zone of mindfulness to stop and think, am I being caring enough? Am I being considerate? Am I taking the employee into consideration? When we first started working on these ideas, we actually called them mindful engagement. And it starts with the idea, it's actually a research finding that leaders learn what they need to know to lead and move up the organization and be effective. They learn that through experience, not actually through books, not actually through courses, they experience and other people like mentoring and role models. 
So if 70% of your learning is through experience, you can't go through your experiences mindlessly. You're giving up 70% of your development. And so for some people, they have to learn to be more mindful in order to come across as more present, to be more approachable, to have their subordinates think they're more approachable. But for other people, there are other issues. Uh, But for everyone, you need to put your own growth on your agenda. And so this approach to growing your leadership in the sample we're talking about, yeah, those people are hugely busy. They really can't afford the time to go off to a training or go off to a personal development seminar. This is an approach that can be used on the job, intermingled with what you're doing anyway. It just asks you to sort of get develop an intention about what where you need to grow personally so that you can be watching that as well as getting your leadership tasks done. And I, I copied down a term that I read in your book, and you can tell me, is this a known term or is it something you developed? Emotional regulation. Is that what this is called now? Well, I, I see emotion regulation, which is not a term I developed. It's actually an active research area. I see that as one of the things you need to pay attention to. If your emotions run amok, you're never going to be able to get what you need to get out of a situation for your personal growth. You're not gonna learn about the ways in which your uh, ideas are falling flat or your management isn't having the consequences you want it to have because you're all up in your anxiety or your anger or your impatience. So your emotions really can get in the way of your learning. And so you need to develop strategies that allow you to kind of lighten the emotional load and um, deal with your emotions so that they don't prevent you from learning what you need to know. Now, I copied down a quote. You say the power of flexing is about how we grow more personally and interpersonally skillful. And I kidded you before the show. I said, is this, for instance, if I come into your office and barge in and say, Sue, I've got, and then you stop me and say, you didn't knock on the door. And, oh, yeah, I forgot. I've got to knock. I knock a few times. You say, come in. And then we start talking. Is this kind of learning each other's ways and the manager learning the ways of the workforce uh, and and kind of, I guess, putting it, I don't want to say in writing, but more defined rather than just doing it on a day-to-day basis and we, we learn as we go, let's put it that way. Well, it is that. It is bringing it more into your consciousness. I do think managers pick up a lot of things and a lot of habits through osmosis without much consciousness. Um, so they did, but unfortunately, some of those are habits that are not actually working for them and about which they're not particularly aware. For example, if someone reacts to someone walking into their office with the front of their hand saying, stop, you know, they may not even be aware that that's something they do a lot. And that people not only stop coming to their office, but stop telling them their ideas, stop, um, you know, telling them their concerns, stop sharing their new ideas with them. And, you know, it stops a lot of things. If that manager becomes more aware and sets a goal to try to be more approachable for his subordinates or her subordinates, then he might notice things like, the hand that he holds up that stops people in in their tracks. Um, Similarly, the person who barged in and then is asked to knock might notice that that might be a better habit in order to work with this manager. Leadership is an interpersonal sport. It's a contact sport. (laughs) And so interpersonal effectiveness needs to be something on your agenda. It's totally intertwined with leader effectiveness. I'm writing that down. Leadership is a contact sport. That sounds like your next book. I I think that's a great title for we. It's funny. So many times as someone talks, we get what would be the title of an article or a next book. And that that may do it for you. So at this point in the show, we'd like to remind our listeners that they're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Sue Ashford. She's the author of the power of flexing. And Sue, can you tell us one where we can get the book? And if there's a website where we can find out more information? Yeah, you can pick up the book at uh, Amazon online, Barnes Barnes and Noble in your local 
And also, if you go to my website, susanashford.com, I have links to all the places where you can get the book as well. And if anyone didn't get that, we'll ask you that information again a little later in the show. So uh, if you're having trouble with flexing at work and if you want to learn some of these new terms like emotional regulation, uh, just keep listening to what Sue says and pick up a copy of Power of Flexing. So one of the takeaways that I got from your book was a quote that I wrote down. Growth is painful. That's why few choose to do it. Is that why people avoid this or if they don't do it because it's a change in the way they do things and we don't like to change? We do love our comfort zone, right? And our comfort zone is made up of our habits and the kind of a typical way we go about dealing with the world and dealing with other people. I identified two triggers for this whole process of growing. One is your fantasies of the future. So this might be your fantasies of the future Sue or the future Bill, how I'm going to be. And it might be because I saw someone else act in a way I really admired and I want to be like that person, or I just have this image of who I want to be. You know, some of your listeners are quite young, maybe starting their first professional jobs, and they maybe have an image of how they want to be. And so they will be working on growing towards that image. So that's fantasies of the future. Uh, The other is pain of the present. (laughs) A lot of times we want to grow just because it's painful how we are right now. It's not getting us what we want in terms of career progress. It's not getting us what we want in our interactions with other people. Um, And it's painful. Someone's given us feedback that lets us know exactly where we're falling short, or we just can see it. We have a bad relationship with our parents or our relationship with uh, a community group that we're trying to influence isn't going well, and it's painful. So we adopt uh, a goal. We We take on an intention, an intention to grow in a particular way aimed at helping get getting out of that painful present and into a better future. Now, Sue, I read that there's two kinds of people, people with a prevention focus and a promotion focus. And that was the first time I heard these are new terms to me. Could you tell us what those kind of people and is that something like DNA or being left handed? You know, we either are prevention or promotion focused Can we change that? Are we 50-50? We can change it. We probably have a dominant tendency. It's not DNA, but it's probably based on our experiences growing up. I think I use the example of my oldest brother. Um, And we grew up in a fairly middle class, upper middle class household, but my dad lost his job and there were six kids. And it was scarring. I mean, it was scarring on me and I'm sure on my, my family. My brother lived his whole career in a prevention focus. He had a family to take care of and he was going to succeed in taking care of them. And he learned with that focus. He stayed at one aerospace company his entire career, which is almost unheard of. He made himself indispensable. He kept learning a new skill, a new skill, a new skill in order to prevent losing what he had, losing his job, et cetera. My daughter has more of a promotion focus. She just likes to learn stuff. Um, She just took on learning Java just because she thought it'd be cool to know. Um, And it really had nothing to do with her job. It really just was something she wanted to know. So it was just kind of, what do I see in the world that's an opportunity and I can take advantage of and I can be creative with it? So there are two very different sort of ways of going at the world. I didn't invent them. This is a psychologist have talked about this for a long time. Um, You can both be pushed into one or the other by the circumstances. Um, You know, if a company starts to go under and your job's about to be lost, you'll probably move right into a prevention focus. But you probably have a general tendency that has been shaped by your upbringing Everything from what the economy was like when you graduated college, research has shown that's kind of a scarring experience as well. You graduate in 2009, you know, there weren't any jobs and it really threw people and takes takes a while to recover and can set them on one path or the other for a long time. Now, I love the stories in your book and one of them, and again, we talked about this before the show, was I think a gentleman named John Horwitz. 
And can you tell us about him and what happened to John? So John told me the story of uh, he took a job in a consulting firm, like a one single shingle consultant, and he started working for him. And he was doing pretty well. He was not very far into it. And his boss said, John, I'm going on a holiday. I need you to hold down the fort while I'm gone. His boss went on holiday to Europe. He actually was in a car accident and passed away. And there's John with the company and has to make a huge decision about, do I invest in the company? How, you know, how do I do that? How do I become very quickly everything that my boss was when I'm fairly new to uh, the situation? So again, it's a little bit of a mix of the pain of the present. I need to grow to keep this company going, meet the client's needs. And then also sort of fantasies of the future. Maybe I could be as good as my boss. He saw something in me and maybe I could rise to be that. And so he took on as an agenda item, just the idea of growing so that he could be the best new consultant and a seasoned consultant he could be. And I like to tie it in with another story that you had later in the book. There was a teacher, the name you gave him, I think, was a fictional name, Jordan Jeffers. And uh, why did we bring that up and why did you bring that up in the book? What was it about Mr. Jeffers that was unique? That one you'll have to tell me. Where was that? It was early in the book, I think around page uh, 14. But oh, oh, okay. if, if I remember, he was kind of that tough teacher who uh, didn't want to teach too much. Yeah, you threw me when uh, you said later in the book. Uh, Jordan had a mentor. He talked about uh, an image that he got into early on in his career by a teacher. He was in a very tough program. Um, and the teacher basically said, yeah, you guys are all on your own and didn't do anything to help them. And for Jordan, that really set a um, pattern of self-reliance that really worked well for him but he had to grow to understand that it didn't necessarily work well for everyone else. And they needed to have him sometimes do more than that in order to be the manager that they needed at the time. But it's a good example of how these role models that we encounter early kind of imprint us uh, for the long run sometimes. It really, I thought it was very good. It made an impression on me because I'm thinking as a student, I would hate a teacher like that. What am I paying for? Aren't you supposed to teach me, be available, uh, open new doors yeah. for me and, and tell me how to research? But on the other side, in the real world, what if you took it seriously and went through the course, you learn some real world lessons because just as the Mr. Horowitz in the other example, sometimes you're going to get dumped into something where you're going to be doing tasks you're not really trained for, maybe not quite prepared for or not prepared enough. Uh, but this is called real life, and we've all kind of experienced that. L yeah, I love that take on it. That makes sense. And sometimes it's not a negative. Sometimes if you're doing really well, you get dumped into those things because people want to challenge you and help you to continue to grow. So, But yeah, self-reliance is kind of a good thing to have. Do most people take responsibility for their personal growth or especially today where we used to, we go to high school. Now we do well there. We're expected to go to college, perhaps get a master's or maybe skip that and go for a doctorate or a law degree, something like that. Uh, have we kind of passed that do-it-yourself area and just, I'll take courses, I'll show you I have two certificates and one degree and start me out at 200000 a year? Well, we do do a lot of the latter, right, <laughs> for sure. But the thing that's interesting about your growth in your personal effectiveness, your interpersonal effectiveness, is it's a little bit like exercising and eating well, exercising after you've left, you know, team sports and eating well after you've left, you know, the oversight of your parents. It's going to be your choice. You're either going to exercise or you're not going to exercise. And people live their lives in both ways. Um, and personal growth is also kind of your choice. I think it's a really important one. I think the themes we've talked about here, the world changing around you and you needing to be ready for it, uh, your, your personal circumstance change, because the book isn't just for people in organizations, but let's say you're, um, you know, 
going along and, and, and parenting children and all the children leave and there you are in a house sitting there by yourself. You know, your personal circumstances change that require new things from you, new growth from you. I personally think that it is a conscious choice and one of the best ones you can make. I think it puts people in a creative, self-developing, you know, empowered place that allows them to create the person they most want to be in life and to get the things they most want to get in life, in their relationships and in uh, having influence on others. So I think it's a great thing. I think one of the best things you can say about a life at the end is that person kept on growing. And that was a person who's kept growing. It seems that's what the people want today. They don't want to be told as much as we did years ago, and they want to develop themselves in, in different respects. So once again, I want our audience to know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is Sue Ashford. Her book is The Power of Flexing. And Sue, could you tell us once again the website and where we can get the book? You can find information about me at SusanAshford.com. And there are links there to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, independent booksellers, uh, or go to the independent bookseller in your town and pick up a copy. Now, we have great authors on our show. We've been on 33 years now, and such as yourself telling us these things. And in your book, and I wrote down a quote, leaders get their most important lessons, not through school or book learning, or shows like ours, perhaps, but through direct experience. After all these years of us going to school and being told, take the AP courses, take the advanced, go get a certificate in this, it seems it's almost back to the good old days, learn on the job and uh, get the, you know, follow the boss around and learn how to shoe that horse or uh, till the fields or whatever you're doing, whatever field you're in. But is that something new we're learning or is that a theory that's just coming to the forefront? Well, I would never argue against the power of of higher education. I'm a firm believer in it and I've devoted my career to it. This idea is that 70% idea that I told you earlier that if you survey top leaders who are considered effective, they will tell you 70% of what I learned, I learned through experience. So how does book learning and degrees come into that? Well, you know, part of what you learn in your undergraduate degree is required to get you into those experiences. It's kind of a gatekeeping. And then part of it is it gives you the frameworks and and sensitivities to understand a lesson when you see it um, from those experiences. So I think both are useful. But I think in particular, when you're learning to be personally and interpersonally more effective, experience is your best teacher, but it all depends on how you go through the experience. There's nothing inherent about putting someone in a challenging experience that means they're definitely going to learn a lot about who they are and how they come across. They need to be attending to that. And so the practices I lay out in the book are just a little structure that you can use to go through experiences and get a lot more out of them. Now, Sue, you mentioned uh, the 70% rule, and I copied, again, something you had in your book, 70-20-10 rule. The 70% right. is experience. What's the 20 and the 10? How else do we get 20%, our learning? Yeah, 20% is other people, like things people will teach you or things you observe other people doing, sort of role models. And 10% is books and classes. So it's kind of ironic that I wrote a book about this, but my book is about how to get the most out of the 70 percent. So I think it has a lot of relevance. Well, it, it, it does. And you're waking me up to things because this is a topic that no one else brought up. I'll be honest with you. I had never heard the term power of flexing. And you've woken me up when I'm looking at this. And even though we kind of know this in the back of our mind, it's our career. We have to take the steps necessary Do we really do that? Do we act on that every day? Are we ready for it? And at some point in the career, whether it's 38 years old or 52 years old, don't we say, you know what, I've done everything. I'm going to coast for a while. And maybe that's just the time we shouldn't start coasting. So uh, we have to see what happens. Now, I know you have a drill that you ask executives to create a sketch of the highs and lows of their career. 
Why are they doing that? Is this art practice or is that uh, just something you've come up with? Well, I mostly use it for people to get to know each other and for people to, you know, on a first day of an executive program and for people to see that the challenges that they've faced are pretty similar to challenges other people have faced. So they, they, and it gives them a chance to really think about and talk about what they value. So they look at the emotional highs and lows of their career thus far, and they talk about why was that a low? What value was being challenged at that time? Why was it a high? What value was I living out at that time? Who were the people around me? What was I learning? Um, so it's a way to get to know each other on a deeper level than, than just kind of the surface. But the thing that always comes out of it that I think is super interesting is I ask people, what themes came out at your table? And invariably, they say, we learned a lot more from the lows than we learned from the highs. And I think it's so ironic because we spend a lot of our time in life trying to avoid any low. And yet it's from those lows that we learn the most. So I, I guess we have to consciously take on some challenges, even if that's not our, let's say, norm that we'd rather go through life and just have a peaceful day to day. But by the challenges, even if we don't do well on them, we're going to learn for the next time and be better prepared, like the doctor who unfortunately may not do well on an operation, but he knows the mistake or she knows the mistake they made on that operation and can then uh, make things go better later on. Yeah, I think that's right. And so your um, thought about, well, what happens when you're 52 and you decide I'm just going to coast, you know, yeah, you could do that. You could just coast through the rest of your life. But I know that those people, if they did choose to grow and found a way to do it, feel way more alive and way more, um, you know, personally effective and um, and proactive whether it's something at work, you know, like getting a new task that sort of wakes you up again, or people do it in their personal life or in their communities. I'm going to try to be more effective and influential in my church or in this community organization. But I do know that when you're in a growthful state, that people uh, find that experience both challenging and very enlivening. Sue, we want to thank you so much. We want to remind our audience once again, the book is Power of Flexing. It's by our guest, Sue Ashford. And Sue, once again, give us the website. SusanAshford.com. Easy enough to remember. Thanks so much for being with us today. We'd like to remind our audience that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Oran, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.